What is the nature of your self-image? Do you know your original face? Let's take a deep dive and find out. One aspect on the spiritual path we don't think about is how we think about ourselves. I mean, our self-image. Like when we think about ourselves, how is it that you're thinking about yourself? Are you thinking about yourself as a spiritual self, as just your ordinary person? How are you thinking about yourself? And what is this self-image that eclipses seeing the world as it truly is? Because that is one of the biggest problems, if not the biggest problem on the spiritual path. Your subjectivity gets in the way of seeing the world as it truly is. Zhuang Tzu said when there's no more this and that, you can see the infinite on all things. You can see the still point of the Tao, right? And so how do we see through the eyes of the Tao? How do we see through the eyes of Brahman? What is this self-image? Now, when we think about our self-image, think about how you've developed that, right? And how it changes according to the rising tides of society and culture. Are you changing all the time because the world is asking you to change? Has your morality changed because a certain morality in the world is in vogue and an older one is out of date? Are you changing because the world is changing or are you abiding in your true original face? Call it Atman, call it whatever you will, but are you abiding in your true self? Now, when we look at the self-image, right, when we look at our self-image, we can see when we honestly look at it that, okay, as we've been brought into this world, we were born as the original face, right? To use Zen and Taoist terminology, you are that original face. What was your original face before your mum and dad were born is a kind of a phrase in China. And so what was your original face? Who were you before you became this person? And so as you see throughout your life, right, you've been brought into this life, you learn the cultural traits, then you learn education, you learn from your family, you learn what it is to be this person that can function in the society. Now, there's nothing wrong with that per se, right? We all have to play a role in this world, as Zhuang Zha says, to function and just to get by with our life. But if you haven't come into contact with that zero perspective, you believe you are the role. And that's where all the problems begin. That's where all sorts of conflict begins, right? And so what happens is as we go forward is we develop this self-image, right? So everything is attached to it, the education, what you learn from your family, your culture, your society, what morality tells you is right now, even though the moral flavors of the time change. And so then you change your self-image accordingly. And then you start to think then according to how the self-image thinks. This is when Maya has got you, the illusion of reality, right? That's what Maya is. Maya is the measurement of reality. So you're downloading all of these moral tenets from society and you are thinking in that way and you are judging the world according that way, judging others according that way. So you have this this and that mentality within your mind which is the measurement of reality you're not seeing the world from the atman right you're not seeing it impartially and so in Taoism, they talk a lot about seeing the world partially versus impartially right drongs has a big emphasis on the impartial perspective where what we're doing with the self image is we're developing a partial perspective of the world a view of the world through a really tiny microscope right we're not getting the whole panorama. We're just they're a little pinpoint, and that's how we're seeing the world. And so once you see the world like that, then that's where all trouble is born from. And that's actually where your suffering is born from because you think that the world should be a certain way because society has told you it should be that certain way, and you've attached that to your self-image, and then you project that onto the world, right? And so then for everyone listening and watching, just think about your self-image, right? Think about how you have changed just in the last five years because of the accepted narrative in the world, right? How much have you changed? Ask yourself that seriously. Because if you've changed, it means the world has a hold on you. You don't have a hold on the world. It's telling you how to think. 
And so if it's telling you how to think and then you are then superimposing that onto the world because you think that's what is right because the world is telling you that's what is right, then you live in Maya. That is a fact. Now, if you abide as the self, as the Atman, the undifferentiated consciousness, then the clouds may change, but it doesn't affect your true nature. And so what happens from that perspective is that if you do abide in the Atman, right, is that your self-image begins to thin out. I remember Hubert Benoit said in his famous book, Zen, the Supreme Doctrine, that one of the practices in the higher teachings of Zen Buddhism is the ability to see the world or to frame the world with no image. Now, what he was talking about is that in meditation, when you meditate, do you have an image or do you think in images, basically? Do you think in language, in words? What are thoughts without images or language? Think about that, right? That, that's a real mind bender. Can you think without language and thoughts because when we think naturally how we've been conditioned is how we how the thoughts operate right we think in language that's why when sometimes when you learn a different language the thinking process is a little bit different but all across the board universally the images of how we think are the same and so in zen buddhism they're talking about is that can you exist without a self-image and images within your mind now, that may be a higher element for all of us to get to a higher level of consciousness, but that's the nature of the mind, right? The nature of the mind is empty, spontaneous, and free. And so the Atman, your undifferentiated consciousness, essentially has nothing within it. It has no conditioned elements within it. There is no self-image. And so as I was talking to you about before, the more you come back into abide as the Atman, that pure non-dual consciousness, the more those aspects within your self-image begin to thin away. And then the self-image becomes very loose. And then you can actually see through it. And then the real nature of the self, the Atman, begins to shine through your personality, your ego, so to speak, because that ego and personality is beginning to thin away. And so there's no self-image then. So it doesn't matter then what the narrative is of the world. Hey, you need to do this, and you're just like this. It doesn't matter. I am all that exists. I am the pure non-dual consciousness and the sense of self that you think that I need to propagate your ideas and your narrative has already disappeared. So we need to all think about that on a spiritual path. How much are you possessed by your self-image? Now, there was an interesting phenomenon back when a certain president came into power and a lot of people who said they were Buddhists or practiced yoga, and, that, and this is only in America, mind you, that when that happened, they all went crazy. And they were writing articles about how bad this guy is and they didn't support this particular president. Now, the real problem here is that if you're Buddhist or you are following the path of yoga, for example, why does it matter who the president is? So that means that those individuals still had a very strong self-image and that they were controlled by whatever the narrative of the time is. There'll always be presidents and leaders that you don't like. There'll be situations in the world that you don't like. But if you say that you follow this path of Eastern spirituality, and as soon as someone says something contrary to your way of life and you lose it, then you're obviously not following the path at all. And that's something for a lot of people to think about. But again, that was only a really strange phenomenon in America. You don't see it in many other places because a lot of people who are practicing Buddhism or yoga, and traditional yoga, I mean here, the tradition of yoga, they don't get emotional about whatever the changing social and cultural dynamic is because the reason you practice Buddhism or yoga is to be free of that. One of the aspects in the traditions is vairagya, is dispassion is having dispassion for worldliness. And so if you are instantly triggered by whoever becomes the president, then you have a big problem on the spiritual path because you still believe in your own self-image. You are still infiltrated by what other people say. You are still infiltrated by the social and cultural narratives. And you are still influenced by your own conditioning. And the point of Eastern spirituality in general is to eliminate all social and cultural narratives so that you can work on the conditioning that you've endured in this life because it's only through working through that conditioning 
that you can see the truth, right? And then you have compassion and love for all people, no matter if you like them on a personal level or not. Which, yeah, mind you, I know it happened, that situation only happened in America, but I think it was more of a byproduct also of social media, of people being so attached to social media. So all in all, if you are being triggered by a lot of things in the world, then you have to then sort of pull back and assess how attached am I to my self-image and am I operating through the self-image more often than not? And so that's the first thing that has to peel away on the spiritual path is this self-image. Now, two of the important steps as we go further on the spiritual path are Viveka, which is discrimination and discernment, and also, as I mentioned, Vairagya, which is this passion or non-reactiveness to worldliness. And so if you practice these two, this will kill the self-image and the ego. This will annihilate it in its tracks, right? That's why within all of the great Hindu spiritual paths, Viveka and Vairagya are the two most important practices. Because if you want to go in depth into your the nature of the Atman, if you want to abide in the Atman, you can't be worried about what's going on in the world you can't be trying to change people or influence people with your own agenda. If you have an agenda, you are still operating from an ego and a self-image. And so this is where Viveka is important, right? Because Viveka, with Viveka, with a sharp awareness, you can see in your own mind when you are operating from the self-image and you are being triggered by things that is only a response from that self-image coming from the samskaras, the subliminal mental imprints, impressions within our subconscious. And so you're only operating from that. So with Viveka, you can notice that, right? You can notice the samskaras being stimulated, which then affect our vasanas, our habits and latent tendencies, which then produces more karma because karma is actions and unconscious actions, right? And so you've got this whole samsara loop going on from samskaras to vasanas to karma and then it reverses because the karma you accumulate become your habits and then becomes your samskaras and so what viveka does is that it notices when you are triggered or when a strong emotion or feeling comes up because of a certain situation but you can see it before you react right and this is what's important and what enhances that as I mentioned, is Vairagya. Because the more you practice Vairagya, the more you could care less with what's going on in the world and people around you. It doesn't mean you don't have compassion and empathy. It just means that you don't have an agenda to push on them. And you're not worried about each and every little thing, right? In the modern day, right, because we have internet and television and so forth and so on, we think we need to be worried about everything. This is a very recent phenomenon and it's having a massive impact on the mental health of everyone in the world. You don't have to care about everything. It's not natural. It's not even natural to know about everything, right? You obviously empathize with other people, but you can't be overly worried about each and everything because we would never live, right? In the old days, things would happen on the other side of the world and you did not even know about it. That's a fact. That is a fact. And now, because of the internet particularly, we know about each and every little thing that's going on right now. But we don't know a lot about the good things, right? It's always the negative things. And there's a lot more positive things happening in the world. You need to remember that humans in general are awesome, but the world is telling you that humans aren't. And so you have to remember that humans are awesome and you have to kind of refrain from this perpetual news cycle of negativity and this perpetual news cycle of narratives and ideologies that are very divisive because that doesn't enhance your spiritual practice and they in and of themselves are false anyway because as I said, majority of the world is positive and people are awesome in general, right? We all don't have to think the same and we all don't have to agree. But in general, most people are just getting on with their lives and are happy in doing so. Only when we start to compare and when we start to get influenced by the world, that's when all suffering occurs. And so it's important then to practice vairagya because when you're practicing that dispassion, there's an understanding that all is Brahman. All is Brahman. If I am concerned about each and every little thing according to my own conditioning and my own subjective view of the world, then I am living 24 hours a day in Maya. 
and not in Brahman. Could you imagine if the world was living in Brahman, most of us? Who knows what would happen, right? We'd all be seeing the world as it truly is. And we'd still be getting along, doing our daily activities and doing whatever our duty is. But we wouldn't have an agenda to push on others because we would understand that everything is shanti. Everything is peace. And you can't understand shanti if you are living through a self-image. It's the self-image that needs to crumble. Now, a lot may disagree with what I've said in this video because you live through your self-image. It's the Atman that understands within you what's being said. It doesn't matter what self-image disagrees with whatever self-image. These are just self-images clashing with each other. You need to be cognizant of how you are being influenced by the world and also how your conditioning is influencing how you see the world. If you take away your conditioning and all of the influence from the external world, how would you see the world? Ask yourself that. How would you see it? And so that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. It's about seeing the world from the Atman and the practice of Viveka and Vairagya and the dissolution of that self-image that we cling so hard to, but it's only when we let it go and allow it to dissolve that we truly understand the nature of reality and who we truly are deep down within. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.